welcome everybody to today's webinar. My name is Sylvie. I work with Cardia Technology and I am the host today. We also have Mike from Cardia as a co-host. Before we start, can everybody hear me well? If not, please raise your hand or use the question box to let us know. Looks like uh, everything is fine. If you have questions during the session, you can enter them in the question box. We will address them at the end of the presentation. Also, the webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link in the next two days. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Harold Rosen. Dr. Rosen specialized in endocrinology and geriatrics. He is currently the director of the Osteoporosis Prevention and Treatment Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Dr. Rosen runs the bone densitometry practice. He sees patients in consultation for osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease. He also does research on optimizing performance and reporting on bone densitometry. He's been very active in the ISCD, which is the International Society for Clinical Densitometry. And Dr. Rosen received the ISCD Award for Clinician of the Year and the Paul Miller Award for Service to the Society. So tonight, Dr. Rosen will show us with very practical examples how he reads and reports DEXA-based bone density scans. Dr. Rosen, we are very happy to have you and thank you for taking the time to be our guest speaker tonight. And uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Sylvie. I hope everybody can hear me OK. Show my screen. There we go. Well, thank you all for joining me. I'd like to take you through reading a couple of bone densities uh, live. Don't worry, everything is de-identified and there are no HIPAA violations here. Um, we will start, um, we're using this software called Bone Station to read the bone densities and it allow us to go through all the necessary uh, maneuvers and, and, uh, and checking that one needs to do as one reads a bone density. We're going to start simple with a simple initial bone density of the spine and the hip on this patient, where we start with the create report option. And uh, a little bit more about this review step two later, uh, it becomes more important when you are looking at several bone densities. But here we have our initial bone density. And we, we see we can review the image and see if there are any problems with the image, if there are any overlying densities that may falsely elevate the result, or any dense sclerotic areas uh, due to a fracture or due to um, degenerative disc disease and such. Uh, and we can see that uh, all four of these vertebrae uh, look just fine. Uh, one of the ways that we're supposed to screen for false elevation of a bone density uh, of, of a vertebral body is to, uh, is to scan through the T-scores. If you start looking at T-scores and you see one for individual vertebrae, that's more than one standard deviation different from the rest, that's a good indication that you may have um, a sclerotic, a focal sclerotic defect that needs to be excluded. In this case, there were none. All four vertebrae look correct. This looks like L4, 3, 2, and 1. And they all look uh, as if they don't have any, um, any problems with them. So the next thing to do would be to click OK and go to Next Scan. Um, this is, again, this review step two, which I'll go into in more detail when we have follow-up bone densities. Here we click Continue, and here we look at the hip bone density. And again, we look to make sure that uh, there are no overlying abnormalities. Much more common in the spine and then in, than in the hip, but they also do occur in the hip. You want to make sure that the femoral neck box is properly analyzed and uh, tucked up here up against the greater trochanter. You want to make sure that the femoral midline is going through the midline of the femoral neck. You want to see very little of the lesser trochanter. That's a cue, that's a clue to you that the technician appropriately internally rotated um, the femur uh, to give a, um, a, valid, uh, a valid result. And again, technically, this looks, uh, this looks just fine. 
uh, and then we would click on OK and go to Add Recommendations. Now, um, in this uh, in this screen, in this what they call Add Recommendations screen, um, the uh, software starts to compile uh, a results table and comments that, again, you see we don't have to write these or dictate them. They all sort of compile automatically. This is also where we get to make any additional comments that we feel are necessary. This particular case doesn't have any, but I have a whole bunch of, as you see here, additional comments snippets that we will deploy later. Uh, but uh, in this case, it's not necessary. We'll click on Preview Report. And all of a sudden, this uh, nascent bone density report appears. And it has in here, without us dictating or without us typing anything, it has the institution and it has the patient's name and demographics. And it has the referring doctor and the indication or the, the, uh, the diagnosis that was given to us by the referring doctor. You have a table of results here where you have, according to each site, the bone density, the T-score, the Z-score, and the WHO classification. Then we have what we call an interpretation, where based on WHO criteria, um, we say that this patient has a normal bone density. Again, the software read this automatically based on the information it had. And it's ready to let us sign off on this bone density. So um, I will take the opportunity to sign off on this bone density, finalize and send report. This is what a, a reading of a simple bone density uh, looks like. I'd like to start adding complexity a little bit at a time. Uh, the next patient we have ready for you is this one, uh, where we click Create Report. Here we have one, again, has single bone densities, all initial, but she has a, uh, a forearm as well. So again, we'll look at over here. Uh, this is the step two of the spine, and this is the image of the spine. Now, this spine looks a little bit different. It looks as if there are some sclerotic areas, uh, no single vertebrae looks out of place, but it just kind of, if you just look at the image, it looks like there's a lot of density that really doesn't necessarily belong there. If you look and, so to speak, run the T-scores, as we say, you'll see that the T-scores of L1 and L2 are substantially higher, or more than one, one T-score higher than L3 and L4. And that should give you an indication to go back and look here and say, hmm, there seem to be some sclerotic changes here. Uh, one could argue at this point to say that you'd want to exclude L1 and L2. Or one could say, you know, L3 and L4 have these sclerotic changes as well. Maybe we just report them all <clears throat> and make a comment that this patient has a spine bone density that may represent an overestimate. The reported spine bone density may be an overestimate of the true spine bone density. And in this case, uh, the technologist wisely acquired the wrist, uh, the forearm rather, because she saw that the, um, the spine is a limited exam. By and large, ISCD guidelines are that we report the spine and the hip. We report the forearm if the patient has hyperparathyroidism or if there are some limitations to the spine or the hip, uh, the, wrist, uh, the forearm is supposed to be uh, reported. So in this case, the technologist correctly recognized that there are some sclerotic changes uh, in this spine. So she acquired a wrist. We'll go through OK and go to next scan. And again, over here, we have the hip. And again, the hip looks well acquired. The femoral neck box up against the greater trochanter. The femoral midline correctly placed in the midline. Very little of the lesser trochanter seen. I'm happy with the technical adequacy. I'm going to click OK and go to next scan. Uh, this takes us through to the forearm bone density. Here we're looking, I want to point out over here, it says technologist comment. This didn't appear uh, spontaneously. The technologist wanted me to know, you know, I did the forearm because I wasn't happy about the appearance of that spine. And uh, this was entered into, in the Hologic, it's entered under what's called scan comment. And in this software, in BoneStation, it appears under technologist comment and allows the technologist to communicate with me and tell me, hey, you know, this is why I did what, what I did. Um, so uh, as we said here, so, so the, 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 the forearm, the, the two technical things you really need to be sure about the forearm, it needs to be straight, which this is. And the top of this region of interest box needs to be here at the tip of the ulnar styloid. 
and we're good to go on both of those considerations, we're ready to click OK and add recommendations. This um, review add recommendations uh, stage over here, this is again where we're able to review results. Um, again, the, the software in, uh, already populated the fact that the patient has osteopenia. As you see here, based on the osteopenia, it populated the, uh, the FRAX data uh, for this particular patient. But here I have something I want to say. Remember, I kept saying to you, you know, it's a good thing that the, the, the staff did the, um, the forearm in addition because the spine does look like it may be falsely elevated. So I can type this in, or I can go to my snippets. These are snippets that I've asked for the, the uh, for for Bone Station to provide me with, and um, and of course anybody can ask for whatever um, snippets they want. And here I have one that says, "Please note that the reported spine bone density is likely an overestimate of true spine bone density because of sclerotic changes, likely on a degenerative basis." But I want to add one other comment. So forearm. BMD is reported as well. Um, so this is the comment I wanted to make. I want to click on preview report. And over here, you see what um, the, the, the um, you know, pending approval, what the report looks like. Again, all the demographics, you have a nice tabulation of the bone density at each site, um, uh, along with the z-scores and t-scores, and as much technical information as you can shake a stick at. Um, you do have the comment about osteopenia and the comment that I put in and the FRAX score over here. Uh, and I'm about ready to sign, but I did want to call your attention to one other thing. You see over here, you have, so to speak, the report. You have the pictures, which is always very nice. And then you have, as if, as we go down, as if this report is being repeated where we say the same thing all over again. Now, the reason we've asked Bone Station to be configured this way is that um, when a radius is done, for good reason, you get to generate a whole nother bill. That is to say, uh, the um, CPT code for central uh, DEXA is 77080. If you have clinical reason to do a radius as well, that's a whole nother CPT code, 77081. And it is perfectly legitimate to submit a second bill for that as well. So in this particular case, we would have been billing two bills. But you can support two bills with a single report. It is for that reason that we call this the central DEXA report and basically repeat it down here as the peripheral DEXA report. They're the same language in the sense that they both contain the spine, hip, and forearm but it allows you to support billing for a second, um, uh, a second CPT code uh, legitimately. And this is something that, uh, that this software does for you. Um, on that note, I'm going to finalize and send the report and move on, if that's OK, to the next bone density. This patient over here, uh, this one will be a little bit more complicated in the sense that we're going to look at what happens when we have prior bone densities. So this is where this review step two that I kept talking about becomes important. It's important when you have a, a current and a prior bone density to make sure that they were done on this, in the same scanning mode and on the same densitometer. Now it turns out here that as you see the scanner serial number is different over here. Um, that is OK though in the sense that we uh, got rid of this machine and cross calibrated this machine to that. So that although it's not the same machine, it is cross-calibrated to this one. If it were the scanning serial number of a different machine that wasn't cross-calibrated, we couldn't make a uh, proper formal uh, comparison. So uh, as long as basically everything is all in black and not in red, we're good here. That's what the review step two is for. And this brings us now to the current bone density of the spine on the left and the prior bone density of the spine on the right. And you can see that um, four vertebrae are chosen. It's the same four of vertebrae. You can tell down here this is the sacrum. This is L5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, and uh, that uh, the same four vertebrae are, are selected. 
there doesn't look to be any particularly dense spot overlying uh, the spine. I will point out this that looks like a clip. It looks like a metallic density uh, that probably uh, was placed in the interval. But since it doesn't overlie the spine, I think we get to ignore it. And again, we do a quick uh, running the T-scores to make sure there's no T-score that's way out of line with the other that would call our attention to the possibility of needing to exclude it. But technically, it seems that this, uh, this bone density is, is, is quite adequate, and the comparison to the prior is quite adequate. So we're going to click on OK and go to Next Scan. We again go to Review Step 2, this time for the hip. Again, it's the same scanning mode and the replacement of that machine. So we're good to go. We're going to click on Continue. And then we're going to see over here that this is the current bone density of the hip. This is the prior. We're going to see that we wanted everything comparable. We see the femoral shaft straight. We see that the top of the region of interest box is right up here at the acetabulum, exactly the way it is here. We can look at the size of this box, 92 by 105. It's the same. There's no right or wrong size of a box, but on repeat, you want to make sure that the size of this box is the same size as this box so that you're comparing apples to apples. You want to make sure that the femoral neck box, again, is nicely tucked up against the greater trochanter, the femoral midline correctly placed in the midline, and similarly, that you see very little of the lesser trochanter on both of these. Uh, technically, uh, excellent, uh, flawlessly done, and I have no problems with this bone density and this comparison. So I'm going to click on OK and go to Add Recommendations. Here for the first time in this Review Add Recommendations um, uh, uh, window, you have the fact that the densitometry software, that I'm sorry, the reporting software, now generates for you um, a narrative. That is to say, there was no significant change in the spine uh, between 2015 and 2017. Uh, that's based on the fact that we have programmed the machine to know what the least significant change is for our center. It's 0.034 at the spine and 0.038 at the hip. Uh, so, um, so this 4% decrease that we tallied up here gets translated into no significant change at the spine. And this 7.9% or 0.05 grams per centimeter squared decline in the hip bone density gets translated here into bone density decrease significantly by 7.9%. Uh, and we're going to go then to preview report. I could overrule any of this stuff if I felt like it, but it's all technically uh, excellent. And again, here you see all your names and your demographics. You see the tabulation of the current result and the tabulation of the previous exam, where you see over here uh, the prior and the current spine, the prior, I'm sorry, the current and the prior spine, the current and the prior hip, and you see the percent changes versus, versus prior, and you see the narrative, the patient has osteoporosis, no significant change at the spine, but there is a significant decrease at the hip, and uh, this is all to my satisfaction. So at this point, we will sign off on this one. If we have time, I would like to show you one more, one more wrinkle on this, and this is when there is a VFA, or vertebral fracture assessment. Do I have time? Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. All righty. So we'll go to this patient, and we'll see over here uh, the review step uh, two brings us to uh, the appearance of an AP, and a lateral spine view. Uh, this is, of course, the famous VFA. It's acquired um, uh, according to ISCD, either when the patient's over 70 years old or uh, when there's been height loss or steroid use. Um, in this case, what, what you're seeing on the lateral view, um, it's a little bit easier to see on use uh, this called view the light box. A little bit easier to see. This is the sacrum, of course. And you can see the overlying iliac crest. This then is L5, L4, 3, 2, 1, T12, 11, 10. And on the AP view, I, I'm sorry, on the lateral view, I really can't see clearly past T10. Up here, it's all kind of a big smush. So I couldn't really say much about 
the integrity of the vertebrae above T10. If you click on this, you see why, and that is to say when the spine isn't straight, i.e. because of a scoliosis, uh, where the beam isn't parallel, it's really hard to get a good look. So at least on the AP view, I can see a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, T12, 11, 10, 9, 8, maybe even T7. So I can be fairly clear that up to T7 on the AP view, there's no fractures. On the lateral view, I really couldn't see above T10. So I'm going to make a comment on this. I get to close out of this um, light box view, and I uh, come back to the um, to uh, review step three for the VFA. I'm going to say that I, I it is indeterminate up here, uh, that is to say above T8. But I will make a comment here, and I will say resolution was poor on the lateral view above T10. So, I mean, I'm not saying that I swear there's no fracture of T8 and T9, but I mean, within the limits of, uh, of my resolution, I would say I saw no definite vertebral fractures. Uh, resolution was poor on the lateral above T10. We're going to go to the next scan, if that's OK. And here we go back again to the spine. There's only one, so review step two doesn't do us, uh, doesn't require much uh, 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 consideration. Here is the spine, and again, here is the sacral ala, L5, 4, 3, 2, 1. These are clearly the four correct vertebrae. You see T12 up here. You don't see any T-score outliers. You don't see any overlying densities. Uh, we're happy with this, and we can click OK and go to next scan. Uh, in the hip, again, there's no prior hips. And again, this is a nicely done hip. Um, femoral midline appropriate, femoral neck box, nicely tucked up against the greater trochanter, and very little of the lesser trochanter showing, suggesting adequate internal rotation uh, by, uh, by the technician. We're going to click OK and click Add Recommendations. Now, um, over here, there's not much to say other than the fact that the, uh, the software has read this as a normal bone density. We're going to go to Preview Report. And again, we have here a nascent report with all the necessary information. Um, here you have the central DEXA report. And as you scroll down, you see that you have here the vitiba fracture analysis report. And it says that uh, we couldn't see much over T, uh, above T8. Uh, and the resolution was poor on the lateral view above T10. And we have essentially here two separate reports that are melded as one. And we have the opportunity to finalize and send the report. And uh, with that, I have concluded my prepared remarks. That is to say, I, uh, I wanted to show you these three or four cases to show you the outline of how, how um, one reads uh, bone density uh, in this setting. Uh, there's lots more that we can talk about. I wanted to stop at this point, give people an opportunity to comment or ask questions. And there's lots more cases if you wanted to go through them. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosen, for uh, sharing your expertise here through these uh, very real examples. We have uh, some time for questions. And um, again, you can use, attendees can use the uh, questions uh, box to uh, to enter their uh, points or comments. Uh, we have a few questions here, so uh, Dr. Rosen, I'm going to read the first one. Uh, the first question is, how does Bone Station have access to scans, including prior scans? Ah, very good. I can answer this one. So when Bone Station, um, w w when one uh, requires bone station. By the way, let me, stop, let me back that up a little bit. You don't have to have bone station to read bone densities. We used to have uh, a bone densitometer and printed out the bone densities. And we would take it back to the office. And a technologist would sit there and copy the results, transcribe the results into a Word template. And uh, that's how we reported bone densities. Needless to say, nobody's excited to uh, spend time transcribing and copying. Uh, it wastes a lot of good time and creates a lot of potential for errors. Uh, Bone Station is a uh, software that can be you know, installed in the institution. And basically, it communicates with the densitometer. 
uh, if the densitometer is plugged into the internet, you can send the bone density studies electronically. There's a term called DICOM, and it stands for something or other, but basically it means you uh, electronically transfer the bone density from the densitometer into bone station. Um, and uh, um, then when the reader is good and ready, he logs into bone station and has his cue over here and says, well, I, I'll read the bone densities. Uh, and, and this allows um, him or her to read the bone densities, uh, whether sitting in his office or in clinic or on vacation. You know, from any place in the world, you can read the bone density. Well, that's great. So um, we have another question, which is, uh, what does the finalize and send mean when finalizing the <laughs> report? Very good, very good. You didn't, you didn't let me get away with that. So finalize. Here, I'll show you. Once you finalize the bone density report, I, I just want to say this is a demo, so if something doesn't work right, it's all cleaned up so that nothing here is, is protected health information. So I hope this is all work like it's supposed to. So if you go to search reports and search the reports that were done today, I just did three reports today. Ah, very good. All right, so then Bone Station now has these reports. So you and I just read this report on the patient DY, and here's the report. But as you will likely say, what the heck good does this do for me? If you have a report sitting on some computer, how do I get it to where it needs to be? So when we first got Bone Station, the first thing we did was, um, uh, you know, my, my staff would, when completed, they would print a report. And again, you know, a copy would go in a, on a piece of paper in an envelope and send it to other people who had similar paper records. Uh, needless to say, this is the electronic age. And uh, the, the newer version, to make a long story short, is when the IT people get together and um, this report is automatically transferred to your electronic medical record. So as it stands now, every time I read a bone density, within 15 minutes, a PDF is generated of this. And that PDF um, gets sent to my hospital's electronic medical record and uh, is then a, a permanent feature of the hospital's medical record uh, for this patient. But again, I mean, that requires this other piece that uh, the people uh, 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 the EMR people call an interface. They do this all the time, by the way. They do this for um, uh, uh, for GI reporting, for GI endoscopy reports and such. So uh, there are different types of reporting system, and they can generate a uh, a PDF that communicates nicely with the um, with EMRs. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Another question here is. Why did the third case not have a FRAX score? Ah, so as I recall, the third case had osteoporosis. But let me check that again. Um, so by the way, this software, uh, yeah, this one was the third case, right? Yeah, so she had a T-score of more negative than minus 2.5. So she has osteoporosis. Now, remember, FRAX can be reported in people with normal bone density, osteopenia, osteoporosis. You could report FRAX on anybody you want. The ISCD guidelines are, uh, and I should say the NOF guidelines are, that we use FRAX in order to help us decide which osteopenic patients to treat, right? Osteoporotic patients need to be treated. Normal patients don't need to be treated. Osteopenic patients, well, there are osteopenic patients that have very low risk, and there are those that have very high risk. So ISCD recommends that the report should include FRAX in people with osteopenia. However, I have to say, in all honesty, sometimes my referring doctors want FRAX no matter what. They get whatever they ask for. If they ask for FRAX, they get FRAX, uh, on, um, even in an osteoporotic patient. But we just kind of wanted this presentation to be one that was consistent with um, uh, ISCD guidelines. OK, thank you. What, what were, or what are, sorry, the FRAX questions and risk factors? 
Very good. Very good. So um, let's go back and reread that bone density, and I'll take you through. Um, I'll take you through to that. So that was number two. Very good. So we're going to pretend we're reading this. This. Sorry. There we go. That we're reading this bone density again. So if you remember, uh, we went through the spine. We weren't too happy with it. Um, uh, uh, technical adequacy, and uh, here's the hip, and we have a wrist as well. I'm sorry, I'm zipping through this, but I want to take you to this part, the questionnaire. Bone Station has its own questionnaire. Uh, it's a FRAX questionnaire, and uh, it has in it uh, to fill out, uh, if you want a FRAX, you would click this, and uh, you would answer the six, uh, the six questions that the densitometer doesn't send through. In other words, the densitometer sends information on the patient's gender, on the patient's height and weight, on the patient's bone density. So if you if you remember, there are 12 things in FRAX, really only 11 of them count. But the six questions that one must answer are these six. So if you um, say that you want FRAX and you want to say that, well, this patient has had a prior fracture and this patient smokes, you would save those uh, questions, I'm sorry, and then you would go back here and f uh, the FRAX score would magically appear here in your report. Um, uh, the same as if you had gone to the FRAX website and inputted this data manually. But basically the, the, the software is allowing you to utilize a lot of the information that came through, sent through the densitometer, in addition to a few other questions that you answer, and it gives you the FRAX. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Now I have a question. Uh, how how many DEXA scans do you read per week? Well, at our center we read about 120 per week. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Let's see. We have another question, which is: Does is is uh, if there was a fracture on a VFA, would it change the assessment? Ah, very good, very good. So what happens if you see a fracture on a VFA? Let's go back to um, this patient's report. I'm sorry, I'm going to take you through the report um, again. Right, right. So if, for instance, uh, we were reporting this patient, and let's say we had decided that T12 had a vertebral fracture, then we would say um, yes, and let's say for the moment that this patient had a mild, I'm sorry, a moderate crush fracture. As you see over here, once you have vertebral fractures, you get to grade them uh, with the Genant semi-quantitative grade that uh, mild, moderate, severe, and uh, you know the type meaning crush, wedge, or uh, biconcave. And let's just make believe that we were reading through this bone density here. Um, now, what we're supposed to be going through our mind is that if somebody has had a vertebral fracture, that almost defines them as having osteoporosis, doesn't it? In the sense that it almost doesn't matter what the bone density is um, if they've had a vertebral fracture. Now, one could argue back at me and say, well, how do you know, Rosen, sitting here in front of your computer, whether this patient had a big car accident. Maybe she flew 30 feet through the air through a windshield, came down flat on her back, and in a car accident, in the context of terrible trauma, fractured T12. In which case, a fracture like that doesn't upgrade their diagnosis to osteoporosis. Um, the way we handle it in our center is um, if bone station senses that I have said that there's a fracture, it immediately, as you see, I didn't type this in it puts in this information. The patient has uh, normal bone density. If the fracture observed on VFA occurred without significant trauma, the patient should be considered to have, now it doesn't say osteoporosis, it says skeletal fragility. And if no other causes of skeletal fragility, such as malignancy, are noted, the patient should be considered to have osteoporosis, even though the T-score is not supportive of this diagnosis. Now, this is just how I do it. I think it's well supported in the literature to do something like this. 
I think to say, oh, she's had a vertebral fracture, that's osteoporosis is a mistake. They may have had a big trauma, or they may have, God forbid, multiple myeloma. So that's why this language was developed here to tell you that if they had no big trauma and uh, if they uh, don't have any other cause, then the proof is, so to speak, in the pudding. Uh, this patient should be considered to have osteoporosis. Uh -huh. So this is, this is something that you decided at, at the beginning. It's your, your own words that were put in this. Uh, right, in although I, 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 I have no proprietary interest in them. And obviously, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Bone Station, if one acquires Bone Station, uh, Bone Station can be set up with any sort of personalization and all of my, uh, whatever snippets I've come up with or, or uh, language or settings is, is absolutely uh, free to be shared with anybody who's interested. Uh, thank you, thank you. Somebody uh, is asking, uh, does it work if there are more than one reader? Oh, you bet it does. You bet it does. Uh, so I have a partner, and, uh, you know, you have this entire list. Whenever you log on, you have this big list. So whoever goes first can, can grab a bone density and start reading it. Once I click on this bone density, my other partner won't see it. So he won't be able to click on it. But uh -huh. he can take another bone density. And we absolutely can be reading um, at the very same time and no one's stepping on each other's feet. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Um, I'm going to ask if uh, somebody wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand if you are in the middle of writing a question. I will uh, wait a few. Yes, we have a question coming up. Somebody says, what about TBS? Ah, very good, very good. Um, so, uh, as it stands right now, I don't think that Bone Station um, has a, um, an accommodation for TBS, uh, but I should probably defer further to Mike. So, uh, for TBS, we do support it. It's kind of just coming online with some of our customers. Oh, wonderful. Um, we don't have a way to get the actual DICOM TBS scans from the DEXs just yet. That's coming, but right now the on the FRAX questionnaire that Dr. Rosen showed you, we, we have the text enter the TBS score for now. And uh, we have a FRAX adjusted with TBS coming up uh, this winter. Awesome. We have another smart question here. That is, uh, how useful is TBS? Maybe I'll take that one. Um, TBS is mildly useful. Uh, and there's no question that uh, there was a nice review published and it would suggest that the uh, area under the curve predictivity, pr prediction value for bone density plus frax is whatever it is and a few percent better if you add in TBS. That is to say, you will have a little bit better ability to distinguish between uh, people who fracture and don't. Uh, so TBS adds a little bit. One of the nice things about TBS, it's not a separate test. You don't have to acquire another scan, another image. You don't have to do any more radiation. So that's a nice thing about TBS. The more practical problem with TBS is that um, uh, the software costs a substantial amount of money per densitometer, and the report, um, a report with TBS doesn't get, so to speak, reimbursed at any higher rate. So people that are feeling that they're barely breaking even or losing on bone density are often ill-inclined to throw in away another $10,000 for that software to get paid the same amount um, and basically be, uh, you know, have their, their bottom line be uh, even more so in the red. So I hope that that answers the question, you know, clearly and to the point. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. 
Uh, right now, I do not see any more questions. Wait just a few seconds. Sylvie, do you think there's any interest in reading another bone density since we do have some time? That's a good question. So I will, um, you know, maybe in the in the question uh, box, if uh, attendees could answer yes, we we have one person who said yes. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. So I had, of course, something in reserve. So we're going to read this person's bone density, and it gets a little bit more complicated. This is somebody, so this is again step two in the spine, and we see that this person has had two prior bone densities, both in FAST, um, again, all on comparable machines. But if you notice, uh, it's uh, L1, 2, and 3, you don't see L4. Uh, we'll, uh, this preaks up our interest, but we'll go to continue, and we'll see over here that from the beginning, L4 looked a little denser, a little more sclerotic. Um, makes some sense in the sense that you see here an osteophyte, as a matter of fact, a bridging osteophyte. Um, so um, you see here sclerotic changes in osteophyte. Clearly, um, uh, the technologist at her own discretion uh, quite correctly excluded L4 from analysis. And on the baseline, on the current uh, bone densities, uh, that's comparable. Uh, the, the, the same four vertebrae are reported. You see over here, this is L5, this is L4, and otherwise uh, it looks fine. A couple of things uh, uh, bear mentioning. This little highlight over here tells you there's, this is baseline, this is current, and this is the intervening spine. This is the one that was in the middle. And again, all three uh, are correctly done and comparably done. The other thing is that the technologist was kind enough to send me a little message here and says, that does not meet ISCD criteria. Apparently, the ordering doctor was asked if he wanted a VFA and responded, you figure it out. Basically, we, uh, at our center, we allow people to say they want a VFA, they don't want a VFA, or they want us to determine if the patient should have a VFA. Since the technologist is in a good uh, situation to do that, based on age, height loss, and steroid use, the technologist decided not to do the VFA, but she's now telling me, you know, I didn't do the VFA because it does not meet ISCD criteria. That's what that little message is. Doctor, uh, so Dr. Can... Rosen, Dr. Rosen, just I thought yes. you, sorry to interrupt you, but, but because we have two interesting questions. One, one person is asking, uh, was asking if you have examples of a VFA fracture, which maybe we can do that later if you do. Uh, sure. The other, the other question here is, why is the left-hand image so much clearer than the right hand? Excellent. Right, right. So the reason for that is in the interval, um, this densitometer uh, is, a, a, again, this new densitometer that we installed about a year ago. The software, this Horizon Hologic Densitometer, gives you much crisper pictures. It's just, <laughs> just a prettier picture. So you're right. I mean, there, there is a qualitative difference to these pictures. And this is what uh, the, um, the discovery looked like, and this is what the horizon, the horizon looked like. Um, so we'll move on here. And uh, the hip, as we said again, there are three hips, a current and two priors. And uh, so we see over here the current. We see over here the, uh, the baseline. Uh, and we see over here the uh, the uh, the one in the middle, and we see again the uh, top of the hip region of interest box is nicely placed at the acetabulum. The region of interest size is comparable, 104 by 96 for all of them. And uh, we'll head on over here. Uh, here there's a wrist, a forearm as well. And again, the top of the ROI box is here at the tip of the ulnar styloid. Um, and uh, we see over here the, the forearms are, are nicely uh, 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 vertical, nice and straight. We're going to click on OK. And again, over here, the software tells us that by the uh, least significant change we gave it, there's no significant change at the spine, hip, or at the wrist. And um, to preview report, we have this report where, again, we have the demographics, we have the 
bone density tabular results. And we have previous exams, three uh, exams for each spine, hip, and radius. And that's, I suppose, it for this bone density. Um, in terms of what a VFA looks like, if it's uh, fractured, I think I will go to PowerPoint, if that's OK. Everybody can still see, right? Yes. Sorry. Um, there we go. So this is what a normal VFA would look like. Here you see the, uh, the sacrum, a lateral view of the sacrum. L5, 4, 3, 2, 1, T12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. That's about as high up as you can really tell. Otherwise, it's just kind of smushed. As you see over here, um, it has the telltale white arrow, of course, the white arrow that we put in. But L5, 4, 3, 2, 1, T12 has a, a, a mild wedge deformity, a mild wedge fracture. And uh, that is uh, significant. If the patient had osteopenia, it would upgrade the diagnosis to osteoporosis. If the patient had osteoporosis, it upgrades the diagnosis to severe osteoporosis and makes one consider uh, the possibility of the need for aggressive treatments, such as anabolic drugs, uh, rather than the standard anti-resorptive. Yeah, I mean, I have lots more of these, but uh, but it, it, does, does that answer the question adequately? I think so. Um, I don't see any comment. Yes, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. So this this was great. This was great. Um, is there any other question? Looks like uh, everybody's happy. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosen, for your time. It was very, very informational. And uh, I thank everybody for attending. And I, as I said before, uh, we will be sending the recording of this webinar to everybody within 48 hours. Thank you. And bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>